For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and this is a new podcast to the Inside Carolina lineup up in the rafters where 2017 ACC Player of the Year and National Champion Justin Jackson and myself will be talking about all things Carolina basketball. Before we get started, though, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Be sure you subscribe to Inside Carolina wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube so you never miss out on any of the content the team at IC puts out. The support doesn't go unnoticed on this end. Speaking of support, we want to support the people that support us, so that's why I've got to mention our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt. When it comes to Carolina Apparel, they have everything that you could possibly want. The T-Shirts, the jerseys, the hats, you name it, they will probably have it because it's great people and great customer service since it's locally owned and operated by alumni. You could visit them in person if you're going to be in Chapel Hill on Franklin Street or online at johnnytshirt.com. And don't forget, Inside Carolina premium subscribers save 10% off their orders. It's up in the rafters. As always, I'm joined by my guy, Justin Jackson. And Justin, not much has happened since the last time we talked, besides UNC pulling off one of the most improbable wins in school history. And some are saying the best regular season win in school history. Some are saying it's, it's right up there with any, any championship win. It was, it was that good of a night where Carolina wins at Cameron indoor in coach K's last game there by 13 as a double digit underdog. What will you remember most from a night that will live on forever in this rivalry? I mean, I think that's, what you just said is exactly what everybody's going to think about is, you know, all the respect to coach K and everything that he's done in his career, right. He's one of the best coaches to ever coach. Um, but the whole year it's been kind of like a farewell tour for him. And that night was like the, the ending of it, right. Like that was the night that was like, you know, probably in their minds, it was like, man, we finished this with a win. It's like literally a cherry on top of everything we've done. And they came in and, freaking ruined it I mean they had coach K heated when he came back out of the locker room like they had everybody flustered so I mean I think you know that was one of the best wins just because of the fact that they were able to stay focused and fight through all of the extra stuff that was going on you know like that's that's hard to do whenever you know the media everybody is talking about how coach K it's his last home game last home game You got 90 plus former Duke players in the gym. You got Adam Silver in the, in the stands. Like, like it's, it's hard to do that, you know? So I think that's why it was so impressive was because they were able to stay locked in and still, you know, come out 13, 14 points on top. Yeah. I think the thing I'll remember most is just the, the overall, the ridiculousness of the, the entire spectacle where it, In hindsight, it seems like nobody at ESPN or Duke even considered the fact that UNC could win or else or else you have that ceremony at 3 p.m. And what you're left with instead is Coach K coming out mad after the game, after he addresses the team for, you know, 10, 15 minutes where all the UNC fans were sticking around. We we have the popcorn. We're waiting to see what's going to be said. And, you know, one of the first things he says is he tells the crowd that either has camped out for months or paid thousands of dollars to be quiet. It's like, exactly. Exactly. That's how, that's how, you know, he was flustered, man. Like there was (laughs) like, there was nothing else he could say. Like, he just felt like he had to say something, you know what I mean? Like, so that, I think that's what's so enjoyable for UNC fans is like, you just, you can see in his face, like he's so angry that they didn't win that game. Um, but yeah, that's the thing though. Like it, fe- I f- it felt like nobody thought UNC could win the game. Like going into the game, literally, it was like, oh well, it's it's Coach K's last home game. They're playing against UNC, but you know they'll probably get the win. They'll do the ceremony, whatever. Like UNC never really had a shot in people's eyes, and they went out there and freaking they did the thing. If you were a casual basketball fan, I don't even know when you would have realized that Duke was playing North Carolina because it felt like. The first time we heard anything about North Carolina wasn't until the tip off, but obviously, you know, uh, a UNC fan or an ACC basketball fan knows the season's always going to end with that Duke game. But Carolina was was the afterthought and what a lot of people consider the best rivalry in college basketball. And I think 
I kind of went into the night with not not crazy high expectations. You know, you're a double digit underdog. It's it's not crazy to think you're you're not going to have the night kind of go your way. And as the night went on, it felt like a comedy writer was like, you know, how can I make this night even funnier or even better or to where like if you, if you would have told me some of the things that happened, like I wouldn't even believe it. Like it's like, how can I make this night funnier? Uh, here's a clip of Jay Williams in the crowd begging for the time. <laughs> He's begging for the timeout. It's like, oh, what can we do next? Uh, let's cut to you know two students dressed as Bert and Ernie crying, <laughs> crying in the crowd. It's like, and then you get the the post game handshake where, oh my gosh, you know, apparently Hubert Davis said in his post-game press conference, I'm not post-game press conference, in his uh, midweek press conference last week that he's talked to Chris Carrawell and Nolan Smith and they've kind of uh, hashed everything out. But what, what was your takeaway with the handshake line and then the the reasoning after the handshake line where it seemed like Duke was just mad that UNC wasn't wasn't bending the knee to... to that's, that, that's my thing, man. Like we're all competitors. You know what I mean? Like we hate to lose. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I, I literally hate to lose. And especially in a rivalry like that, I get it. Like you're upset, but the reasoning that was given of why they didn't shake his hand was absolutely absurd. I'm going to be honest with you. Like it was, it, it made no sense. Like you were mad because coach walked past you and 90 others that were in the same t-shirt to go shake coach K's hand. So it's not like coach Davis walked past everybody. Right. And like, okay. Oh, he's just, okay. He's being mean. Like, like he's, he don't want to shake anybody's hand. He walked past y'all because y'all were in the same exact shirts as everybody else. Grayson Allen, Jay Williams. Like you were in the same shirts as all of them. They all, the yeah. Yeah. they all had you know the K shirt. Yeah, yeah. They all had the K shirt. Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know to shake your hand either. But to, to, to blatantly do that in the, in the handshake line after the game, that was like the most unprofessional thing that I've seen in a long time. Like especially Carewell. Like the way that he looked at Coach Davis, pulled his hand away, and sped up. Like almost, and and I don't want to. I'm not trying to disrespect the guy at all. Like I'm not trying to disrespect him at all. But it looked like a little kid, like trying to like, oh, hurry up and get behind the other guy so he doesn't see me like that. That that's what it looked like. And so, like, for me, as as a as a former player at UNC and like a part of the rivalry, for me, I didn't like to see that because it was like, okay, we've all had wins and losses within that rivalry, but you can still shake hands, show professionalism like you can still do that no matter whether you win or lose, you know, so that kind of bothered me. Cause I was like, that just, it, it's not a good look, you know, but I'm glad that they hashed it out. They talked about it. Um, obviously, you know, they said it was a misunderstanding or whatever, but I don't know. Initially I had to tweet about it. You know, initially I was like, ah, I don't, I don't like this. Off, uh, off this handshake line and off the, the Juwan Howard, Michigan, Wisconsin one, I've seen a lot of people saying like, Oh, college basketball should, just kind of get her get away from the handshake line when in reality all you're asking people to do is just act like grown men <laughs> it's like hey i know i know competition can get heated but for 10 seconds just go and shake the other person's hand all you have to do is shake hands and say good game bro that's literally you don't have to do anything extra you just and especially nowadays, like some guys just kind of give you, it's like a, like a high five almost. Like yeah. it's not even like a handshake. You know what I mean? So it's like, that's all you got to do. You could hate the person across from you. Just say good game and keep walking. That's all you got to do. You know, it's, it's not, it's not that big of a deal, bro. The other note I made before we get into some of the, the game specific type stuff and how this kind of affects Carolina and the big pitchers. Did you know that, Saturday was also Duke senior night. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no Nobody idea. Nobody else knew either. It was canceled. They canceled. I feel, I feel terrible for those seniors. I have, I had no they, idea. That it was they had night. Joey Baker. The reasoning that's come out afterwards is they said Joey Baker could come back for his COVID 50 year. Um, so that's why they didn't honor him. And then they have um, 
Bates Jones, Daniel Jones's brother, and Theo John, who are grad who are grad students, and they said they don't do senior night for grad students because they've already got their senior night somewhere else, and it's like for <laughs> for you you can't honor the grad students and somebody like Theo John who comes in for a Duke, but we're gonna have a ceremony for somebody who is saying they don't want to make everything about. Uh, you know, you know <laughs> we'll just keep it moving. Hey, man, look, look. Just like just, I said, this is gonna like be I, yeah. Uh, like I said, bro, I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here and talk bad about you know these people, but come on, man, you got to have a ceremony for for guys that have been there for four years, four years or more. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you got to you got to at least say his name or something. Like I had no idea it was senior night. Literally, no idea. Yeah, so it, it would hey. be like if Carolina didn't honor Brady Manic and said like you know Brady Manic got a senior night in Oklahoma when you're kind of as I'm saying like he's he's not really a part of he's yeah. not really a part of us so we're not gonna you know come on bro come on Theo yeah. John was out there playing running around on the court that night he definitely is a part of y'all y'all might as well go ahead and he, celebrate he was doing a lot more than running around he was he was out there playing like a linebacker playing like a <laughs> linebacker bro like some of the blocks that he had was like dude this guy is a freaking animal but yeah that's wild i had no idea it was senior night to be honest i had no idea uh going going to the game now there there were a few points in that game where it looked like the unc team we saw earlier this season would have let the game spiral out of control they would have folded especially in that kind of environment they were down nine late in the first half, and then they were down seven with like 1244 left in the second half. What do you think has kind of changed with this Carolina team to where they were able to respond and respond in such a big way? Yeah, I mean, I think you've kind of seen it over over the past few games that they've played. Each game, they've kind of gotten better at like closing out games. Um, you know, I think one thing um, I know, uh, I think it was Marcus that was talking about it. One thing, they didn't sub the whole second half. Like, guys stayed in the game, um, which can take a toll, but thankfully it worked out well for them. Um, so you had the same five guys out there kind of seeing how the game is changing, seeing what like what changes they need to make. Um, but then you just kind of saw maturity and, like, shot selection, execution on offense, I think especially down the stretch – the way that they were getting open looks was all based on how they were executing. Um, and they were finding the open guy making the right read. And then defensively, they were, they were competing, man. Like they were, they were really out there, you know, doing everything they possibly could to get a stop. And so I think it's just kind of how you've seen the last few games and kind of the last, you know, whatever month, um, how they've continued to kind of keep that momentum going and, and, you know, figure out ways to win. So, I think this game was so impressive because of the fact that obviously it's a rivalry game. You know, Duke is rent, was ranked, you know, top five at the time. Um, but them, like themselves, it seemed almost as if they were focusing on what they needed to do. You know, they weren't worried about anything else outside of basketball, outside of their team. They were focused on what they needed to do, what they needed to change, do better. And they went out there and won the game. You mentioned the the no subs in the second half, and that starting five has gotten the nickname. I'm pretty sure Adam Lucas gave him, gave him the nickname, the Iron Five, because <laughs> of what they did out there. Can you get into that further? How impressive is it that they were able to compete at that level with no subs? And even further, they were getting better as the game went on for people like myself who have never been in that kind of environment and know what exactly – um, just just the game of basketball and that kind of intensity takes out of you. It's very impressive. Um, you know, for one, any other game to play a whole half is crazy. I mean, that's, you know, you have four, what, four mandatory timeouts um, and then a few, like maybe you might have one or two other timeouts outside of that. But playing for 20 minutes straight is, is that, that takes a whole lot. And then you add the fact that you're in a game of that magnitude um, with the crowd going that crazy against a good team at the end of the day in Duke, um, you know, that's, that's, that's hard. <laughs> um, 
I would say the next day they definitely had off. Like they definitely did not touch a basketball the next day. Um, they earned it. Yeah, they earned it. I mean, that, like 20 minutes straight in, in a game of basketball against Duke in a rivalry game is that, – that's one of the hardest things you possibly could do. Um, so I got to tip my hats to those guys because they really grounded that out. And honestly, it didn't even really look like at the end of the game, like they were really that – tired to be honest like they didn't even really look like they could they look like they could have gone five more minutes um so i think that's that's just a testament to them buckling down and saying all right you know we gotta go out here and win this game no matter what it takes so that was super impressive brady manic played all 40 minutes rj davis played all 40 minutes caleb love played 38 leaky black played 37 armando baycott's the lowest out of everybody he played 30 minutes but only because he was in uh, early mm-hmm. foul trouble in that first half. But when when you do play your starters that much, you you can expect for them to make up a majority of the scoring. But for the first time in school history, four Tar Heels scored 20 or more points in a game. Baycott led the way 23, as he's kind of done all this year. Caleb Love, 22. R.J. Davis, 21. Brady Manick, 20. What do you think that scoring distribution means for this team as we go into the ACC tournament and then the NCAA tournament that you do have four guys that can go for 20 plus and even on the same night for the first time in school history, they could all do it together? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. Um, At the end of the day, they're not a super deep team, you know, so they're not going to have somebody come off the bench and score 15, you know, so I think the fact that it's shown that when they play the right way, they've got a bunch of guys that can put the ball in the basket. I think that's huge. Um, I think they have to do a concerted effort of doing exactly what they did against Duke and finding the open man, making the right reads, um, making sure to get everybody involved. If they can do that and they have, they're not going to score, four guys aren't going to score 20 points, you know, every game. But if they can do that and get everybody involved, I think honestly they, they could be a pretty dangerous team, bro. Like that that game really, I think that game really showed um, that offensively they can really do some things if they uh, if they if they make the right reads and, and find the open guy. Yeah, and when when you add Leaky Black into that starting lineup, um, I saw this this tweet that I just put in our group chat earlier from at Evan Maya on Twitter and he had the the best five man lineups in the country and it was adjusted for the strength of the opponent and Carolina their their efficiency rating that starting five it's it's up there with any other team in the country I think Carolina was 13th right behind Duke so it's almost like when this starting five is together kind of like people thought before the season started like they are just as good as any team in the country and I think they kind of proved that and when you when you add in somebody like Leakey, he scores all six of his points in in the second half, timely baskets, and then more importantly, AJ Griffin, his matchup, who goes for a career high twenty seven last time, Leakey holds him to five points on Saturday, and I think everybody kind of assumed that UNC was going to have a tough time with the matchups after what we saw the first time in Chapel Hill. Hubert Davis he puts uh, Brady Manick on Paolo Banchero. Bonchero shoots just 30% in the second half uh, with Manic making him earn everything and outworking him. What did you see defensively from this Carolina team that let them have success on the defensive side, even though Duke did shoot um, right about at their season average for percentage? Yeah, I mean, they were competing, man. Like, obviously, we know Leakey is um, one of the best defenders in the country, uh, let alone the ACC. So we know whoever he's guarding, they're going to have a tough time, right? They're going to have a tough night. Um, but obviously, for one, the confidence that Coach Davis instilled in, in Brady Manning to put him on a bench arrow, I feel like is is one thing that should be talked about, right? Like Brady has had games where guys have lit him up. You know what I mean? Like there's been games, Wake Forest, there's been other games where they've really gone at Brady. Um, but the fact that you know, Coach Davis had enough confidence in this kind of game to put him on that caliber of player shows that, you know, obviously that coaches out there really trying to just encourage and keep guys going. Um, but then, too, Brady was working, man. Like, 
even though he got scored on a few times, you know, guys got some buckets. He was out there competing, bro. And, you know, I think that's, we've talked about it all year. Like the competitive spirit that these guys need to win games. They showed every bit of that in that game against Duke, you know, including Brady. And so if they can continue to play like that in every game, I mean, you got to look at Duke is, you know, at the end of the day, Duke was, you know, one of the favorites to win the national championship. Right. And so if, if they're able to compete and play like that against a team like that, then going into the ACC tournament and the NCAA tournament, if they can continue to do that, they can make a run and they can be super dangerous because offensively they obviously show that they can score the ball as well. So um, I think just seeing how hard they really played was, was really impressive to me. Yeah. The other thing that I wanted to mention about Brady Manick that I thought was really cool from Hubert Davis's post game Hubert was basically just asked like how emotional he was in the locker room. And he was like, you know, I'm an emotional guy all the time. My wife gets on me all the time. She says I cry too much, but like, (laughs) it's okay to cry. It's okay to show emotion. And then he was going into this story about Brady Manick from the game where uh, with like 30 seconds to go, Brady Manick came up to him and was like, you know, thank you coach. And Hubert was like, for what? And Brady Manick was just like, you know, just for giving me this experience and letting me be a part of this Carolina program, which I thought was really cool. And you you could see it with, with Brady Manick. He's, he's out there 40 minutes a game, giving it everything he has, because not only does the game of basketball just mean a lot to him, but, you know, being a part of, of the Carolina basketball family, but um, sticking with uh, the point with the, the switch to Hubert Davis as the coach, the offense, it's it's a lot more modern now. He wants to get his guards involved with uh, more ball screens, and you saw that on Saturday with somebody like R.J. Davis' this huge performance. You you know I'm fired up anytime R.J. Davis does anything. I'm repping. Yeah. Any- <laughs> <laughs> I'm repping. I'm repping anybody from New York. You know, we got Cole Anthony. We got R.J. Davis. Carolina could just use more, more New York guys. I've I've always said that. I always believe it. And after Saturday, you see why R.J. Davis has that dog in him. Has that fight. He goes for a probably his best game in in his career, where they're pulling Mark Williams away from the basket with that middle pick and roll. As someone who sees the x's and o's differently than the normal fan who's just turning in to uh espn six o'clock to watch this game you you can kind of see the ins and outs and how the game's kind of breaking down do you think carolina found something sustainable there where they did shoot 59.4 percent from the field in the second half getting that middle pick and roll more involved yeah i mean i think you know it depends you know game to game you know, when you have a shot blocker, a guy that's really at the rim trying to block everything, um, and he does a great job of it in, in Williams, um, you have to try to pull him away from the basket as much as possible. And I think that's exactly what Coach Davis did. Um, and he just continued running it. You know what I mean? Like he just kept on running it until they stopped it and they, they never really stopped it. And so I think the toughest thing, you know, the one thing about basketball is no matter what you do, there's always a way to break down a defense. Like it doesn't matter if you're playing a deny or you're playing a a two, three zone, or you're doing this or that, there's always a way to break it down. Right. And against a Duke defense who basically they pressure you, pressure you, and they try to send you to the rim and they've got this shot blocker at the rim ready for anything that you go with the only way to defeat that is to pull him out to the perimeter and get him into some sort of action. And I think that's exactly what you saw coach Davis do. And they kept running it until, until the end of the game. And you saw RJ was, I would, I would say that that was arguably his best game from the standpoint of every read that he needed to make, he made, whether it was him to go score the basketball or him to find Brady with a pick and pop or find Armando Armando down low he made that right read almost every single time. Um, And so I think that's what was so impressive was in that kind of game where you can kind of lose your head and you can, you know, they might score a few times and you come down and say, okay, we got to get a bucket. You really saw them. Okay, come on, like, come on up, bring them up. Like, let's, let's get back into it. Let's, let's make this thing happen. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's the, that's the, 
the difference I feel like in that game as opposed to other games was whoever had the ball, whether it was Caleb or RJ, really stayed level-headed and made that correct read as opposed to trying to force something, you know, in a time that you could very easily, you know, try to force something. Yeah, the guards did a, a great job breaking breaking down the defense and then from from offensively to defensively, every every button Hubert Davis pressed was working and I think he he definitely deserves a lot of credit for that performance where he goes into Cameron Indoor on Kay's last game and he he's running laps around and he's out coaching one of the best coaches in college basketball history but we're going to take a quick ad break here to let the national guys pay the bills and then once we get back we'll continue our conversation all right we're back Justin whether whether it was Armando Baycott in the post game interview on the court with Holly Rowe or it's former players on social media. The first thing that they're saying after a game like this is that they're just so happy for Coach Davis. Why do you think that is? Because Coach Davis has gotten the brunt of a lot of the hate, man. Like, um, you could have put anybody in this situation um, having to fill the shoes of a Roy Williams and you would still have haters, right? Like you would still have fans saying, why is he, why is he coaching? Why is he out here? And to see him be able to pull out a game like that. And to, like you said, it wasn't, it wasn't just them winning the game. He made adjustments and he did things throughout the game that won them the game, you know? And I think, you know, obviously it's been, we've talked about it. It's been an up and down season. Um, you know, they've, they've had some losses that they probably shouldn't have had or whatever. But if you look at the last month or so and the way these guys are playing, it's a completely different team, right? It's a completely different team. And it's based off of, in my opinion, how Coach Davis coaches these guys. And I think for all of those, you know, so-called UNC fans that have been sitting there on their couch talking about and tweeting out, you know, Coach Davis isn't the right one for the job. Coach Davis doesn't need to be out there. I think he pretty much shut everybody up with this game against Duke and how he coached, how he decided not to sub anybody in in the second half, how he decided to run the high pick and roll, you know, to end the game, how he decided to, to do these matchups um, and instill the confidence in these guys throughout, throughout the week and, and leading up to this game. I think that's why so many people are so happy for coach Davis is because he's kind of carried that, that burden of the up and down season. Right. And everybody's, you know, talked down on him, talked bad about him, yada, yada, yada. And now he comes out with this kind of win and it's like, man, like that's exactly what we knew coach Davis could do. You know, it was just a matter of everything coming together. And so I think honestly that it was just kind of a, to all the haters out there to kind of shut up, you know, and all the fans that, you know, think they know what they're talking about to kind of sit down and, and put that phone down a little bit and get off of Twitter. I think that's really what kind of game that was. Um, and I think that's why so many players that have been in at UNC or, or in basketball were so happy for Davis because that that's really what that was. So you're saying he might know what he's doing. I've been saying that Coach Davis knows what he's doing. You know, it, it, it hasn't necessarily come to light every single game, but I've been saying that he knows what he's doing. It's just guys, you know, fans want things to happen right then and there, you know, as if it really affects them and their everyday life. You know, it's like, no, he knows what he's doing. He's got things going in the right direction. It's a brand new team that's finally starting to kind of find their groove, figure out how to play with each other. Um, and figure out what they need to do to win games. So I'm, I'm happy to see. I text them after the game just telling them I'm, I'm so happy to, you know, so happy for you, so happy for the boys, um, you know, because at the end of the day, that's a huge win. And, you know, it's a huge win in, in a lot of facets. Yeah, I, uh, I still have the receipts still from a lot, of, a lot of tweets that I had from where I said, you know, how, how are people actually calling for a head coach's job 17 and a half games in um we'll 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 save that for another podcast another time going 
going into the postseason now, what do you think this win does for UNC to where they've they they've had a couple of quad one wins, but they not only beat a a tournament type team, they beat one that is a serious national title contender. Yeah, I mean that's um, you know I don't know how much it's going to necessarily change their seating and everything like that in the NCAA tournament, but for them, their confidence level should be out of this you know out of the roof um, going into these tournaments. You know, obviously the AC t- ACC tournament is tough having to play games back to back, whatever. Um, but especially going into the NCAA tournament, it's like okay, we we went in we went into Cameron Indoor, you know. Or, we went into their gym, beat them with a whole spectacle of Coach K leaving, and they're considered a national title contender. And so for us, when you think about the mentality, it's like, okay, we can we can beat anybody. You know what I mean? Like up until that point, they really didn't have a game that they had won that it was like, okay, you know, confidence-wise – we feel like we can go in here and really beat anybody. That game was it right there. And so I think it came at the perfect time because now you can go into the tournaments with that same mentality. And, you know, hopefully they can continue to do that. I hope they enjoyed that win. Um, I hope that they were able to, you know, really celebrate that one because it was a big one. Um, Even though they didn't really win anything from it, that, that was a big one. And so you enjoy that. And then now it's time to get ramped up you know, you play again tomorrow, you know, so it's like, let's, let's, let's get going again. Um, and let's try to win this ACC tournament and kind of keep the momentum going. Yeah. The players have definitely had enough time to let their legs recover. I think since Saturday, because if, if Carolina is going to make this run in this ACC tight, uh, in this ACC tournament, it's going to take the starting five playing a, a lot of minutes, if, if not all of them almost at this point with, with what we saw on Saturday, but UNC plays the winner of tonight's game. It's a a second round matchup featuring UVA and Louisville. What are practices like where you don't know your next opponent for the quarterfinals and how closely would you be watching that game between UVA and Louisville tonight? Yeah. I mean, I think the practices turn into more, usually it's like, okay, you're scouting the other team, you know, what plays they run or whatever, what kind of, against like a UVA, like you got to play against their defense a little bit in practice. Um, but it turned into more, okay, we're going to focus on ourselves. We're going to work on our execution offensively. We're going to work on, you know, defensively, how we're going to play, you know, no matter who we're playing, that's, this is what we're going to do. Um, so it just kind of changed up a little bit. It, it, it kind of, you know, you would prefer to be able to scout who you're playing against. Um, but I guess that's kind of what makes these tournaments and the NCAA tournament um so wild is that you just from day to day you don't know who you're going to play um but as far as watching the game you're definitely watching it um to kind of just kind of get a feel of who you might be playing against um but i mean the the tough thing about the acc tournament is you've already played every single team in the acc tournament twice you know so it's not all of a sudden it's going to be a totally different recipe to beat these guys. You know, it's just a matter of remembering how you beat them or how you lost to them and what are the changes that you need to make. Um, So I think that's what, that's what makes the tournament so, so cool, especially for fans is like, it's just going out there and it's just a battle, you know, it's like, okay, you know, my plays, I know your plays we've played against each other already. You might've had 30 against us before, but now like, today is the game, you know? So I think that's what's so cool about it. And it makes, it makes it super enjoyable. That's it for this week. UNC back in action for a quarterfinal matchup against the winner of that UVA Louisville game. It's going to be the last game of the Thursday slate of games, 9 30 PM ESPN from the Barclay center. We'll be back. We'll be back next week to break down the ACC tournament as well as preview the NCAA tournament when that comes out after selection Sunday, but Justin, always appreciate the time. It, it was, it was a podcast where you can never have enough podcasts talking about Carolina beat and Duke. There's never, never such a thing, but I appreciate you, bro.